everybody. This is the afternoon session of the Portland City Council on January 10th, 2018. Carla, please call the roll. Here. 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 Uh, this is a message I'm required to read at the beginning of every council session, so please bear with me. The purpose of council meetings is to do the city's business, including hearing from the community on issues of concern. In order for us to hear from everyone and give due consideration to matters before the council, we must all endeavor to preserve the order and decorum of these meetings. To make sure that the process is clear for everyone, I want to review some of the basic guidelines, which I hope make everybody feel comfortable, uh, welcomed, and respected and to ensure that decorum is maintained for all of us. There's two, uh, for this meeting, there is one opportunity for uh, public testimony. We'll be taking public testimony after uh, the staff report. Uh, you will have two minutes to speak, so please plan your remarks for two minutes. Uh, state your name for the record. We don't need people's addresses. If you're a lobbyist, you need to disclose which organization that you are lobbying for. If you're here representing an organization, please identify the organization. Uh, when you have about 30 seconds left, you're gonna see a yellow light go off on the panel there. When your time is up, there will be a red light and you'll hear a beeper. Uh, we ask you to uh, please uh, conclude your remarks when you get to the red light. Any conduct that disrupts the meeting, for example, shouting or interrupting the testimony of other people is not allowed. Interrupting council dis, uh, deliberations is not allowed. Uh, people who disrupt the meeting face ejection from the meeting. If there's a disruption, I'll issue a warning that any further disruption, if any further disruption occurs, anyone who is disrupting the meeting will be subject to ejection for the remainder of the meeting. And if you fail to leave the meeting, when you're asked to leave, you can be subjected to arrest for trespassing. If you wanna show support, thumbs up. If you don't like it, thumbs down. Um, just don't shout. Expect that here at this table, uh, everybody gets to testify. Everybody gets to express their opinion. Your opinions may not necessarily comport with what's being said, but let's, let's all uh, be respectful of the process. So with that, please read the first item. The item. only item. Item 41, clarify stormwater billing methodology. Colleagues, before I turn this over to Commissioner Fish, I, I just wanna make a, a procedural point here. Uh, as you can tell by the large number of people that are here, the large number of people that wanna testify, this is a very important and a very complex subject. This is the first meeting on this subject. We're gonna hear the staff presentation. We're gonna take the testimony. Um, then uh, we will make uh, what we can of all of that testimony and all the different perspectives. We are not rushing through this. It will not come back to the council until we're ready to have it come back to the council. So I just want people to understand there will be plenty of opportunity for thoughtful input on these, uh, these policies. I also want to personally apologize. I have to leave at 2.45. Today, so I'm gonna be leaving a little bit earlier, but I'll turn uh, the gavel over to the council president at that time. And uh, if you're testifying at that point, I apologize, please don't take it personally. Uh, with that, Commissioner Fish, you're up. Thank you, Mayor and colleagues. Um, I have some brief talking points. The Bureau of Environmental Services manages the city's stormwater system and works with community members, businesses, and property owners to keep streets, public and private properties clear of stormwater. Stormwater runoff can cause erosion and flooding, damaging public and private property. It also carries dirt, oil, and other pollutants to rivers and streams. The Bureau of Environmental Services aims to develop rates that treat all customers fairly. In that spirit, we have Caitlin Lovell and Jonas Beery from the Bureau of, De of Environmental Services and Eric Schaffner from the City Attorney's Office to present the Bureau's recommendation to amend city code clarifying and updating its stormwater billing methodology. Now here's the good news. Today's proposal uh, does not affect the charges paid by a typical ratepayer. Let me say that again. Today's proposal, if accepted by the council, does not affect the charges of the typical ratepayer. As the mayor said, today is a first reading. It will provide an opportunity for the bureau to, to give a overview of the proposed ordinance it will allow the public to be heard and council colleagues to ask questions. And then at some point in the future, this matter will come back to council for further discussion. I'm gonna turn it over now to Jonas Beery, if you could please begin the presentation. 
Great, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, Jonas Beery, I manage the Business Services Group for the Bureau of Environmental Services. Uh, as the Commissioner mentioned, here with me is Caitlin Novell, also from BES, and Eric Schaffner from the City Attorney's Office. Uh, Commissioner Fish asked us to start uh, today with kind of a quick review of some basic building blocks for the conversation. So I'm going to start with a very quick uh, BES, Bureau of Environmental Services 101. Caitlin's going to provide some basic information about stormwater. Uh, Eric's going to talk about the proposed code changes, and then I'll finish up with some financial considerations and community impacts. So to jump right in, a uh, little quick background on BES in our billing, kind of the 30-second elevator pitch style. Uh, BES has two primary functions. Those are to provide sanitary sewer service and provide stormwater management, and we bill for both of those services. Uh, the billing methodology that we developed is uh, consistent with national best practices, as it has been for many decades, and it aims to treat all ratepayers fairly. The BS, portion of the, uh, the BS portion of the utility bill includes two primary components, one that's addressed towards the sewer, uh, sanitary sewer component. That's for the average uh, single family residential rate payer. That's about 60% of that uh, BES bill. And then the remaining approximately 40% is uh, allocated towards stormwater. And I think with that, I'll hand to Caitlin to talk a little bit more about the stormwater component. Thank you, Jonas. Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Lovell. I manage the Science Integration Division for the Bureau of Environmental Services. Commissioner Fish invited me to speak, provide you with some of the reasons why we manage stormwater. <clears throat> At BES, we manage stormwater to protect public health and safety and the environment. Portland receives 37 inches of rain a year, which is the equivalent of 85 billion gallons of water. That is 128,700 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Development changes the amount of stormwater, the quality of the stormwater, and the location and manner in which it leaves a development site. We manage, I'm sorry, we manage our system to address all of these things. And to do so, we rely on a continuous functioning network that includes pipes, swales, ditches, pumps, eco-roofs, and natural systems, including wetlands, floodplains, and vegetation. Typical impacts from stormwater that we see are flooding, pollution from roads, parking lots, building materials, cars, manufacturing, and other land use, erosion, and impacts and threats to our existing infrastructure. All of these impacts affect public's, public health, safety, property, and our river, streams, fish, and wildlife. As a result of these impacts, we are subject to multiple state and federal regulations that obligate us to avoid, prevent, and remediate the impacts from stormwater. Today, we are proposing code updates to explain more clearly how the Bureau assesses charges to support the city's management of these impacts. Eric Schaffner from the City Attorney's Office is here to explain those changes. Good afternoon, Eric Schaffner, City Attorney's Office. Afternoon. The proposed code changes have two main goals. First, the changes would remove potentially ambiguous language from the definition of impervious area. The amount of a property's impervious area is the basis of the city's calculation of the stormwater management charges assessed to that property's owner. The current definition relies on a description of the impervious area's visible characteristics, such as the surface material or what's underneath it. The new definition would focus instead on the ability or inability of that area to absorb stormwater. That is the approach that has been used for years in the city's two main stormwater and sewer related administrative rules the Stormwater Management Manual, and the Sewer and Drainage Facilities Design Manual. It is also, in fact, consistent with the intent behind the current code language, even if that language wasn't expressed as clearly as we would have liked. Surfaces such as asphalt and concrete are listed in the new language, however, so that neither the city nor property owners will necessarily have to calculate runoff coefficients, but the city can take into account less impervious surfaces such as permeable pavers, and porous concrete when assessing the charge. Second, the proposed code changes would clarify the purposes of and the differences between the on-site and off-site components of the city's stormwater management charge. The on-site component reimburses the city for capturing, conveying, treating, and disposing of stormwater that leaves a private property and flows into the city system. It comprises 35% of the overall stormwater management charge and can be reduced or eliminated entirely if the property owner applies for a Clean River Rewards discount. The off-site component is assessed to cover the cost of managing stormwater that falls on public rights-of-way, such as streets and city-owned property, 
it represents the remaining 65% of the overall charge. No reduction of that component is possible because it is assumed that all ratepayers benefit from having streets that are clear of water. The methodology behind those two components of the charge has been in place since the late 1970s. The calculation of stormwater management charges will not change as a result of the new language. Thank you. Uh, so, no. oh, so, so, sorry, oh, no, go ahead, Dan. No, I'll, I can wait till the. Okay, okay. Yeah, so just to wrap up uh, a couple more minutes, uh, wanted to let you know why this is coming today. Uh, we know that this is a piece of code that we get questions about occasionally. Often those come in the phone of phone calls from ratepayers and we're able to answer uh, those questions uh, 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 that way. We also know there's been a handful in 2016 and 2017 of administrative review committee uh, appeals related to stormwater methodology and charges. So uh, motivating to come to council now to get that corrected. Uh, just a, kind of a pause to anticipate a few questions that I expect may be out there, uh, questions you may have about the proposed update. Is there a financial impact to the change? Uh, no, there's not an impact. As the commissioner said, this doesn't change our billing methodology. It doesn't change the bill amounts for the typical ratepayer. Uh, what would the impact be if uh, one property owner or subset of property owners doesn't pay stormwater charges? The impact of that is our cost to maintaining the stormwater system doesn't change. Those costs are spread out to the remaining uh, ratepayers within the city. Uh, who benefits from this change? All ratepayers benefit by updating the stormwater methodology to be clear and consistent. Last uh, point I'll make is uh, we did include a code fact sheet, create a code fact sheet, including information about today's session. We posted that on BES's uh, policy webpage in December. Uh, we also sent a direct uh, courtesy email to uh, a number of customers that we knew might have some interest in this code change. So we've done our best to reach out to uh, folks who may be interested. Um, Understand, uh, as was stated earlier, this is a kind of a complicated and complex uh, piece of, of code. Uh, so I wanted to sort of salt the discussion today. Uh, as the mayor and commissioner noted, uh, we'll collect questions and then uh, have an opportunity to follow up with any uh, responses uh, to your offices or to the public as needed. That's the end of the talk uh, that we have. And uh, I think at this point, we'll open to questions or testimony. Commissioner Saltzman. Well, uh, can you put this in context of uh, Vigor Industries uh, I think they sued us, or maybe they have, maybe it was an administrative review they lost, but they sent you know a quite pointed email a couple of weeks ago saying that this is an in run around. I believe it was a court ruling. So is it has there been a court ruling on this matter? Um, and just explain the, the Vigor Industries right role here. Well, I haven't seen that particular communication, so I'm not sure what they're what they're referring to. But uh, I can tell you that they didn't lose the administrative review. Uh, committee hearing, they won it, uh, and, and yeah, that's, I think that's yeah, the yeah, point. They the, won it, and yet right. they they were saying these code changes were sort of a an end run around that uh, uh, well, prevailing decision, I guess. Right, and, and I I mentioned at the beginning that uh, um, part of the impetus for this was to correct arguably uh, ambiguous language in the code. My opinion is that uh, the code was not sufficiently ambiguous to justify. Uh, Vigor winning that appeal, but nevertheless they won it, and so the city reimbursed them, I believe, $160,000. Uh, these code changes will not affect that retroactively, but uh, it will bring uh, the uh, uh, calculations for all ratepayers, including Vigor, more in line with what was always intended and what has been the practice all along. And what was the point they, they won on? Uh, well, the old code, the current, sorry, the current code language uh, has the word ground in it. Uh, ground. Uh, in other words, uh, it says that the code, and I can just read it to you, um, the stormwater, the question is whether the stormwater can percolate naturally into the ground. And the problem is, is that many of Vigor's uh, usable paved surfaces are not over the ground, they're over the river. Uh, and that, uh, uh, and as I explained, <coughs> they could very well qualify if they uh, um, fulfill the requirements for a discount for the on-site component of the charge. I think they are also asking for uh, the city to, I don't know, remove or reduce the off-site component of the charge, which as I mentioned is not, you cannot reduce that, and that is because we're talking about managing stormwater throughout the city on the streets. So did the administrative review uh, determine that the portion of Vigor Industries property that's over the, the river directly uh, is eligible for an on-site the, 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 the administrative review committee essentially decided that the city could not bill them for that area because of the use of the word ground in the code definition. It was that narrow. So by changing this definition, we are uh, unambiguously establishing our authority to 
assess a stormwater fee for that properties that right. connect directly to the river. That's right. Not and, into the ground. Exactly, because uh, if, if you're interested in some of the background, the, the stormwater uh, offsite component of the charge uh, is uh, uh, assessed based on impervious surface <laughs> of the property itself because that's used as a surrogate for determining how much of a benefit that property uh, receives from the city's managing stormwater throughout the city. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's our presentation, Mayor. Very good. Any further questions to the panel before I open it up for public? I think we have one parent with a child that's asked to go first. Yes. Uh, we have a tradition here when we have lots of people signed up, people with young children, people with disabilities. Um, uh, just let uh, the clerk know, and uh, we'll put you up to the front of the line. Happy to do that. If there's somebody here with a child, come on up. And, uh, and then Carla after the this, first, if you could. Next two. Uh, yeah, okay. please. The uh, first two in list are Ron Schmidt and Bob Sollinger, and they'll be followed by John Wygant, Alan Sprott, and Diana Anders Andreessen. Very good. Uh, again, name for the record. If you Thank you, uh, Mayor, Council. My name is Ted Labby. Uh, I represent the Urban Green Spaces Institute. I also happen to be on the Portland Utility Commission, but I'm here today speaking as an individual and not as a representative of the pub. Thank you. So. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I, I think that was a very excellent introduction to the issue before you today. This really is just a clarification of uh, the stormwater rate charges that we have. We're not changing anything. Um, you know, we all, whether we, whether we, you know, 100% infiltrate our stormwater on our site or not, we all use our roads, our public uh, infrastructure. We rely on trucks that deliver food and materials to our homes. Uh, to the, sh the stores that we shop at. So there's a reason for, there's a, a very uh, reasonable and structured um, set of uh, conditions around the rate structure that makes sense. And um, I'm, I'm, I was a little dismayed to hear that uh, one party has kind of stirred the pot up and created a lot of confusion uh, with folks um, around the legitimacy of these charges. Um, so, um, you know, we're here to really strongly support the reason for that and that this is really, you know, to keep our rivers clean. This um, benefits a whole host of native species that the city has prioritized uh, for conservation, clean water. Um, we do not want to see these rate structures compromised to the point where it undermines the ability to manage the stormwater infrastructure and clean water. Uh, so. Uh, I just want to offer my support for this clarification. Um, and uh, for other members of the public who are here curious, this changes nothing. It's still possible for you to do changes on your land that you know reduce your stormwater uh, rate charges. Um, nothing in the proposed changes will change any of that. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners Udaly, Fritz, Salzman, and Fish. Thank you for all your service. My name is Ron Schmidt, and I am a homeowner of Jansen Beach Moorage, I am, which is a crowdfunded moorage. We're also renters from the DSL. If we were kicked out, there'd be no place for our homes to go to. I am a director of High Noon, the neighborhood association recognized by the Office of Neighborhood Involvement, the only representative democracy of your 96 um, neighborhood associations. And as you know from a few weeks ago, CNAC, uh, thank you for your reaffirmation and your applause of the volunteers of the city. I hope to continue to do that. Today, though, I speak as the president of the Waterfront Organizations of Oregon. Our membership includes marinas and floating home mortgages on the Willamette and Columbia Rivers within the city of Portland. We represent about 1,000 and floating homeowners in Portland. We also represent tens of thousands of businesses, employees, and boaters who rely on the water for their livelihoods, their homes, and their respite. I'm here on behalf of our membership to request that the City Council vote no on the ordinance proposed by the Bureau of Environmental Services to change the definition of impervious surfaces in city code. Our membership views this ordinance and the pretense that it is a clarification as a veiled attempt to permanently raise stormwater fees on a targeted group of ratepayers. On November 2015, ratepayers in Portland floating home mortgages saw their stormwater fees double, some cases quadruple, without warning. The reason for that is the Bureau of Environmental 
environmental services broke their decades of policy, ignored the city code to assess stormwater fees on floating homes. Uh, fortunately, this action was um, one uh, challenged by vigor and they did win by their own uh, appeal committee. I see that I've got 13 seconds left. I've got two minutes more to talk about. I want you to realize that this is something that did not need to be forced upon us. It was forced upon us. Please, let's take time. Thank you very Mayor, much. can I ask a question? Commissioner Fish, you bet. Be because Mr. Schmidt <coughs> represents a larger class of people, I think he should have a, an extra minute or two because I think it's important. And Mr. Schmidt, um, the, the question that I want to drill down on, because we're making no decision today and we've invited the public to come in and give us feedback, mm. is could you specifically tell us how this proposal would impact the rates of a particular uh, houseboat that, that, that you have raised a concern about? I have spent the last four weeks working with your people of BES, also calling into your office. I am a volunteer. I have so many hours in a week, in a day, so many hours in an hour. I don't want to cut into your time, sir. And I got, I think, Mayor, four do I, may I, uh, do I have to be interrupted? Without objection, please go. Thank you very much. Um, I compliment every city worker everyone that is either paid or volunteer, but I have dealt with a whole lot of people that make a whole lot more money than I do on this action. And it seems like every time that we're dealing with something, there was something thrown our direction and we had to grab it and run and that person was on holiday for the next week. This did not have to come up during the holidays. There is no emergency aspect to this at all. And frankly, I'm really tired that the citizens of Portland have to deal with this procedure. Mayor, can it, I just, can I reclaim my time for a second? I, we're, we've extended the clock because I have, I, first of all, I have enormous respect for Mr. Schmidt and the work he's done in High Noon and the work he's done on, on protecting uh, open spaces out, out, out at his way. This is a public hearing <clears throat> not to to flag, to, 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 to flog people for whatever perceived procedural errors. I agree. We're having a public hearing in which I, as the commissioner in charge, am asking you specifically, where do we get it wrong and how would this impact the rates paid by a homeowner? If you don't have specific answer to that today, sir, then I would ask you to make a follow-up appointment or send me an email. But I can't, I can't get at the heart of your concern if I don't understand how it might impact a rate payer. I believe since we have these meetings going on, that written testimony can be sent to the mayor's office, to the city council. We will put together any information you want in terms of how much we've already been paying for our stormwater fees for our upland services. You're gonna find out that most of the people behind me that represent the various marinas in the city of Portland have done everything possible as good citizens to make certain nothing environmentally is affected. Most of us are part of the clean water marina program already. What you don't realize is that there are unique things and we are paying our fair share. I mean, we've got a whole lot of uplands. We've got over a half a mile of parking that is impervious surfaces, carports. We have uh, sidewalks, a half a mile for 175 homes at my mortgage that we're paying for that. Yeah, we do have a 35% uh, credit for the on-site because we are good stewards of the land. We are paying our 65. This is essentially saying we want you to pay more than what the program well, has paid so, before. So just, just Mr. Schmidt, just to be utterly fair to you because that's the purpose of this hearing. Thank you. When I, I got... I, I called you back five times, left five messages because I couldn't read. No, let me just finish. Five times I mm -hmm. called you. Each time I said, I'd like, because I have a lot of respect for you, Ron. You, you, you're on the right side of a lot of fights and from my point of view. And you have a lot of credibility in this, Thank in this you. building. And my question each time was, help me understand how this impacts a particular rate pair. Walk me through it. Now, we don't have to do that today because the mayor has, has made very clear we're not making a decision today. But what is helpful to me is to see a typical <clears throat> customer that, that you're speaking for, someone who maybe has a houseboat or something else, show me how under this proposal they pay more and why you believe that's unfair. That's what I need to see. Because you've already heard testimony that under this clarification, the typical ratepayer will pay nothing more. 
Are you saying that this will not cause our houses to go up more from when you started taxing two years ago houseboat roofs that never had been in the system before? I, I, am, I am simply asking you on this proposal for you to show us how it would increase someone's rate. Just walk us through it because that's, you have every right to do so, but so far you have not submitted that. That's what, that's what I need to see in black and white. So you want to see from BES the satellite imagery that they first hit us with no, no. two years ago. We're Is not that... talking about two years ago, sir. We're talking about the impact of this clarification. I'll follow up with you after the hearing, but I want you to have every opportunity to demonstrate to us how there's a cost impact and what you think we should do if there is one to mitigate that impact. That's the purpose of this hearing, and I want to give you every opportunity to do so. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And if you have uh, written testimony or if anybody else has written testimony, I strongly encourage that. We, we, you know, I'll speak for myself. I love written testimony. And um, so if, if you have longer remarks and what you can fit into, uh, regionally be fit into to public testimony, I'm really interested in that. Mayor, and if you give it to the clerk, it's even better because then she'll photocopy and distribute to all of us. Thank you. And we have Thank one you. week until the next <laughs> hearing to turn in that written testimony. Oh, no, no. Um, this, I think we're going to keep the record open on this. Uh, for, there, there's, we don't have a Mr. Uh, Schmidt, there is no this. reasonable request that you would make today that would be rebuffed by this council. As Thank I've you. said repeatedly, our interest is having a hearing, getting feedback, and getting it right. Wonderful. If you feel that requires additional time to submit testimony, we'll make every accommodation to you as we have every other time you've come to council on an issue of concern. Thank you very much, Thank council. You, I appreciate you. Appreciate your being here very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Bob Salinger. I'm the conservation director for the Portland Audubon Society. And, uh, this microphone seems to have a little bit of an echo. Push, push, push it a little bit close. farther away. Yeah, right. There you go. Thanks. Better. Um, I'm here today to testify on behalf of Audubon. One of our primary uh, goals is a healthy urban landscape, particularly our urban waterways. So we work on things like Superfund, river restoration, salmon recovery, <laughs> protection of key natural areas like West Tatum Island. Uh, and in fact, we've worked with many of the people in this room here today, and uh, they've fought on the side of the environment. Uh, we do support the proposal that, has, uh, that is in front of you right now to clarify the uh, stormwater code. Uh, we do believe that uh, these, these um, facilities should be part of that structure. Uh, as already been noted, uh, many uh, we all use uh, the off-site stormwater amenities, our public roads, our public right-of-ways, and we all need to contribute to that. Uh, if we don't charge a certain segment of the community, that just increases the load on the rest of the community, or uh, we underfund our system and we degrade our environment. As far as the on-site issues go, uh, as has already been noted as well, when you create impervious surface, uh, and that's what we are doing here when we talk about roofs and docks and things like that, you change the way the water enters the river and you change the pollutant load that is in that water. Uh, it has a degrading effect. Those structures also have direct effect on the ecology of the river. Uh, in terms of things like salmon recovery and habitat, when you're putting in docks and uh, facilities with roofs on them, you're having a direct impact on the environment itself too. Uh, and so we believe it is appropriate to uh, put stormwater fees on those sites uh, and to, to charge them for that. Uh, we all need to pay our way in. And all these investments we're making in recovering the damage we've done in the past will be for naught if we don't take care of the problems we're creating today. That's what this does. It allows us to have the structure uh, for on and off site impacts, and so we support it. One last thing I do want to put in the record, and I know I'm running out of time, is that the folks that started this whole discussion were, were Vigor Industrial, and Vigor Industrial has not been a good player when it comes to the river environment. In fact, they were fined last week by the uh, Oregon Department of Environmental Quality $12,128 for failing to do the required monitoring of stormwater on their site for 2016 and 17. Uh, DEQ notes that failing to comply with the modern requirements is there is considered to be one of the most serious violations that they penalize for. So I think it's important to look at the actors that are really behind this and consider that as well. Uh, but we do encourage you to go forward. We encourage you to listen to everybody and, and hear the concerns. But Thank ultimately, you. we need a decision that protects our environment. Thank you, sir. Next three, please. Are John Weigand, Alan Sprott, Diana Andreessen. And Good so afternoon, go sir. With, Would you like uh, to start? Yes, I'm John Wygant. I believe my uh, written testimony is in front of you. Uh, I'll summarize it quickly. 
uh, part of it uh, comes from the issue of what is stormwater. Uh, I looked through uh, the uh, search criteria in the uh, Portland Code and found 89 pages of references to stormwater and didn't find a definition. I confess I didn't go through all 89 pages. The uh, Webster's Collegiate Dictionary does not define stormwater. Uh, Wikipedia has a pretty good definition of stormwater and it says that stormwater uh, has associated with it a runoff and uh, drainage ways. Floating homes and docks have no runoff except what dribbles into the river from the roof. And if we're talking about rainwater, that's not really quite the same as stormwater. So I would, I would claim that your whole definition of stormwater really doesn't apply to floating homes and their docks because there is no runoff, there are no drainage ways, um, the water just goes into the river as it would have if the, the floating homes hadn't been there. Uh, one of the changes in definition here is to uh, permit these fees. I would suggest that there are some other definitions which I've listed which would suggest that these fees should not apply to places like the Columbia River and the Willamette River and any area that's um, got free flowing water. Um, I pretty much covered the benefit to the cost. We do not have any stormwater uh, that has any impact on the environment. Now, that of the uh, roads and streets and keeping those clear, uh, I consider those to be uh, urban services that are generally paid by taxes. And my time is up. So the rest of it's all here for you to read. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners and mayor. Uh, my name is Alan Sprott, and I'm vice president of environmental affairs for Vigor Industrial. I'm here today to ask you to say no to the code changes before you. As individual utility rate payers, we have very little, if any, recourse in challenging uh, BES assessments. As such, we rely heavily upon City Council to closely scrutinize BES's efforts to increase revenue, whether from rate increases or changing the code to secure new sources of revenue. In this case, BES has claimed that this is a matter of clarifying a definition in the code is simply not true. An administrative review committee decision and decades of interpretation by prior BES officials provide perfect clarity that the definition of impervious area does not apply to overwater structures of any type, and this is what this ordinance is all about. The BES mix is mischaracterizing the purpose of this proposed ordinance. It is not intended to clarify stormwater billing definitions or billing methodology. Rather, it is an attempt to create a new source of revenue by imposing stormwater fees on a class of structures that have not been subject to the fee since adoption of the utility code in 1977. Overwater structures, which includes docks, piers, and floating homes, have intentionally never been included in the stormwater rate st structure imposed by BES. The BES is bringing this ordinance forward in response to losing an appeal to the Administrative Re Review Committee brought by my company after BES imposed a stormwater fee on overwater structures at our facility for the very first time. In November of 2015, in an attempt to grow revenue, BES abruptly began assessing stormwater fees on overwater structures. This new assessment was in response to the need to curtail excessive utility rate increases that had become the subject of much public opposition. Just a month later, in January of 2016, Commissioner Fish penned an op-ed in the Oregonian lauding the utility bureaus for holding annual rate increases below 5%, showing the political motivation of BES's attempts to capture new revenue. What actually occurred was a partial shift in BES's revenue burn to certain ratepayers that drastically and immediately drove up their costs. For example, we, we would have been much better off with a rate increase of 10% since BES's new methodology of assessing overwater structures immediately added $70,000 or roughly 17% to our annual stormwater bill. 
Even without this new assessment, our current annual stormwater charges are for, for, are for over $400,000, even though we manage all of our own stormwater on site and are investing millions in stormwater collection and treatment technologies at our facility as part of the Superfund cleanup. Thank you. In short, we are already paying for more than our fair short of stormwater management, and we are concerned with the apparent lack of transparency regarding how BES has gone about this revenue increase. So Thank you. Can, Mayor, can I, just, can I just say, I, I have this sneaking feeling we're going to have a hearing that spends a lot of time with people making unfounded charges about the ethics of the Bureau or about, about their view of the propriety of covering utility taxes and things like that. Can, can, I just, can I just refocus us a little bit on the question before us? We have code language. We've been utterly transparent about the reason for this code language fix. We're asking people to give us guidance as to how to get it right. And, and I would say, Mr. Sprott, and I have a lot of respect for you, and we have, we have a lot of history. Uh, the Bureau of Environmental Services today, as you know, the rate that they charge is well below the rate of inflation. There aren't a lot of utilities that can say that. So to, to frame this as a money grab, I think, is unfortunate. We have seen uh, year after year reductions in overall rate structure consistent with the pledge that I made five years ago when I took over the bureaus. The question before us today is whether this code proposal gets it right. And, and I, I appreciate that you've used the bulk of your time to malign the Bureau of Environmental Services, and that is your prerogative. But the question before us is, have we gotten this code fix right? And if you believe that it either results in an inequity or uh, a cost that's not reasonable, it, we've overstated the environmental benefits or we were out of step with other utilities, I would welcome that testimony in writing from you and we will give it full consideration before we come back to council. Yeah, and I, I, I want to second that. Let's try to do something different than Congress. Let's not, let's not you know, infer what people's motivations are. Let's really stick to the policy. I appreciate the specifics of your testimony. Uh, and again, I'd like to have a copy if I don't already have a copy of your written testimony. That'd be very helpful to me. You've got it. And, Perfect. and with you. all due respect, we started this conversation with BES in 2015, and we spent over $50,000 in attorney fees trying to get it right. BES came in and assessed a fee on our facility that they in the past had explicitly excluded. They accidentally tried to do it in 2013, and we pointed it out to them. Fair, fair, they fair enough. I'm, to answer your question I'm, about I'm, the definition, I'm not, we I'm do not have. Saying, I'm not saying outside of this chamber you can't have that conversation. I'm this is the only the opportunity we've today. had to, to have this conversation. We've tried to do it your way, and we couldn't get through to you people. You have called me. No, we have tried to, to deal with BS at the at the. No. Mr. Sprott, you've neither reached out to the now, mayor then, nor me on the, this. No, but please, you've neither reached out to the mayor nor me on this. For the umpteenth time, and I don't want to become a broken record, every single person here today has the freedom to come and testify whatever they want. They want to use their two minutes making unfounded claims about the Bureau or the intention or motivations. You can do that. But the purpose of this hearing is to have specific guidance as to the proposed code change. If you our, have a better our, suggestion, our position. if you have a better idea, if you have a concern about the way it's constructed. Well, we, we've, we've talked this into the ground. The I will, idea I will is reach, let the, let the current definition stand and, okay. and don't change anything. Okay. We do have concerns with the proposed definition in A, there, it references the stormwater manual as having the definition of impervious area. There is no defined term for impervious area in the stormwater manual. And B, it gives far too much leeway to BES staff to make the determination of what is impervious area, and we just don't feel comfortable with that. I, Both I, are yeah, helpful. I'll, Both I'll, are very I will reach helpful. out to you, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for being well, here. Let me just ask you, Mr. Sprott, when did the Fisher Administrative Schultz. Review Committee issue its uh, decision? Uh, November of this year, October, so November. Fairly recently. Yeah, so it just happened. Okay. And then this is happening. And you challenged it, your challenge started in 2015? Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just have one question. Uh, would you care to address the issue raised by Audubon regarding the DEQ um, concern that you haven't been monitoring your stormwater? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, oh, uh, well, Mr. Challenger is mistaken. DHQ did issue uh, a penalty for which they alleged that we didn't uh, monitor our discharges. That's not true. There was no discharge to monitor. So we'll, we'll, we're appealing that to DEQ, but. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, both of you. Next three, please. Catch 22. Are Jan Zwerts, 
Nikki Carl Charlton and Joy Hoff Hoffaker. And they'll be followed by Kathy Evanson, David Beavers, and Chris Rick. Thanks for Rich. coming in. Good <coughs> afternoon. I'm going to pass. You're going to pass. Very good. <coughs> we do read follow-up emails. So if you want to put something in writing, we certainly read it. Yeah, and, and a lot, lots of people don't feel comfortable testifying, and that's okay. So if somebody's watching this on TV or if there's somebody here, um, always feel free to email, send a letter, call. Uh, we'll, we'll take testimony in multiple ways. Can Jory pass her time to someone? No, no we, don't, we don't unfortunately allow that under council <coughs> rules. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak here at the council. I'm Jan Swartz, a homeowner at uh, Jansen Beach Mortgage. I'm a retired locomotive engineer, a volunteer at the Willamette Shore Trolley as their superintendent of operations, keeping six miles of city-owned operation uh, right-of-way open for future transit use. But to get back to what we're talking about here, at my home, all water falling on our roofs naturally flows into the river. It appears to me that the council is attempting to change the laws of physics by stating a home floating on a river is an impervious surface. Um, specifically around the roof, yes, but everything that falls on the roof immediately goes into the river. Um, raising the costs of home ownership and renters, many who are on fixed incomes, will only ask, ask, make the problem of the uh, ongoing homeless crisis worse, as many of these people are being directly impacted by this raise. We've had to raise our uh, mortgage fees $25 per person per month, so that's about $300 for each and every residence that the Jansen Beach Mortgage is paying an additional this year. So this, if we lose people, we will start losing people and they will have to go someplace. Some will have to go to the street. There's that thin, thin margin for people living on the river. Um, yes, there will be more people moving in, but they will be people who do not have the ongoing knowledge of the river and therefore they will not be able to react properly when a, uh, s some kind of fuel spill or some other river accident happens. This has saved Portland countless times in the past, having a community on the river able to react quickly and swiftly to ongoing problems. So I do not wish to see <coughs> our expenses go up each and every year because we have to have uh, pay an additional fee for storm waters. We're already paying on our parking lots. Uh, I do not see <coughs> the, why we should also be paying on our floating homes. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Good Mayor afternoon. and Commissioners. My name is Nikki Charlton, and <coughs> excuse me, I'm the president of JBMI Jansen Beach. I'm also an attorney and a retired nurse, so I have a great interest in the safety of our mortgage and its well-being. Um, I wanted to address first, with no d disrespect, that I don't think this is such a complicated issue. What we have is we're being taxed on rainwater that falls on our roof that goes directly into the, the river. Um, I heard testimony that the, these stormwater fees are based on um, the sanitary sewer component and stormwater runoff for public health and environment. We have no environmental impact from the rainwater off our roofs. I'd like to point out whatever's on our roof is only dust that's in the air because we don't have trees growing over our floating homes. We don't have anything else that would accumulate on our floating home roofs. Uh, there's no public health <clears throat> impact to that. Um, I also heard that the components that justify this runoff uh, tax or fee is uh, capturing, conveying, and disposing of this runoff water. And in fact, what happens in our floating home is it goes right where it would be disposed of naturally. <clears throat> I also want to point out that, as Jan just testified, as president, I'm part of the board and we evaluate the budget every year. We did raise the rights this year and a great deal of it was because of stormwater issues. We have 
a large parking lot. We pay for our, our structures. We pay for the parking lot and the structures. So we are actually being doubly taxed. If we had our home next to our parking lot or our garage, we would be paying one fee. But we aren't impacting the environment in any way. And I think that it would be reasonable to say this is not a tax for us or a fee for us. Mrs. Charlton, can I ask you a, qu Ms. Charlton, can I ask you a question? Um, first of all, thank you for your very thoughtful testimony. And it would be useful, I think, to us if you gave us some breakdown following the hearing of the impact of this in terms of costs. You had a, another gentleman who testified recently right. about just general issue of affordability. Yes. That resonates with us. So any information you could give us that's not proprietary or confidential. We can do that, About yes. how you're passing these charges on, I think would be very helpful to the council. That was already in my head to do, and I will well, get you're it a lawyer to and a nurse. That, 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 that's as good as it <laughs> that's gets. That's why so, I took the notes. So if you could follow up with us. I appreciate it very much. Thank, Thank you. you for listening. Thank you. And, and we'll, before we'll call up the next three, I, I just want to put a philosophical argument out there, and maybe people can reflect on it, and, and at some point, maybe after the meeting, um, I'm starting to get to the nub of this issue having listened to uh, the first several people testify. And at some point subsequent to this hearing, I will definitely ask about the science related to runoff from roofs <coughs> into the river. But here's where the philosophical question comes in, and my suspicion is my ultimate decision may have to hinge on a philosophical question. I hate it when that happens, uh, because reasonable people can disagree on philosophical questions. This sounds almost like a school funding argument that some people are making, which is, I don't have kids in school, so why am I paying for it? And if that is not this, if, if your argument is that we're not polluting the river through runoff, it's just rain going into the river, and, and that strikes me as a very reasonable argument, not knowing the science, which I will ask for later, then is the argument uh, we should be exempted from this because our particular homes don't contribute to this problem? And if that is the case, uh, is what Mr. Salinger said a moot point? The question that he raised is, don't we all benefit from this kind of a thing, and isn't it a good idea to spread the costs? So uh, I, I don't have a right answer formulated in my head, but it's just a philosophical question uh, that has occurred to me, and maybe people could provide some color commentary as they're thinking about it. Uh, next three. Are Kathy Evanson, David Beavers, and Chris Rich, and they'll be followed by C.W. Taylor, Scott Gard Gardner, and John Johnson. Great to see you. Would you like to start, please? Uh, yes, thank you so much. My name is Kathy Evanson, and I'm a resident of the uh, West Hayden Island Moorage. And I wanted to start by asking um, in the audience here, if there are any civil engineers present, could you please raise your hand? Aren't you a civil engineer? We have one. Anybody else? <laughs> I think we have one up here. Oh. All right. So it does come down to science, and that is really what you're hearing, but you're hearing about it in layman's terms. <clears throat> Stormwater is affected by the amount of volume that hits the ground, the time that it takes to run off and hit a point of discharge, and the quality of that water. And those three items are the items that you control through your City of Portland storm water management plan. When we come to a river, whether you guys realize it or not, water is impervious. Water cannot accept more water. So anything that hits it, lands on top of it, it doesn't increase the amount of water. All right, so it's already an impervious surface, the rivers that we live on, and we are the floating home community, if you will. So when we say to you, we're not increasing our discharge, it's because the river itself is considered impervious. We are an impervious surface sitting over the top of an impervious surface. The water already runs there. The water and the time of concentration that it takes for that water to run off is not increased. The amount of dirt that hits or the, the water quality issue is not increased either. That dirt would have already fallen there and it already hit this river. So what we're saying is you don't provide us that service for that 
portion of our lands, and those are our homes that fall over the river. Your management plan actually states the city's MS4 permit does not cover one, two, three, four, five, six items, two of which are of most concern. The natural stream systems, you don't manage those because they're already managed. It also does not cover direct stormwater discharge from private property to natural stream systems that don't enter your MSA. So in essence, the water that hits our homes does not collect into a system and go to your system for treatment to come back out. You are actually exempted those, and you have in the past, and that's probably what Vigor Industries was trying to say in a more technical way. We're just trying to say it nicely. Um, we do contribute philosophically. We are a contributor in the way that we contribute for offsite impacts. We do use Mayor, these Mayor, I know we're about to lose you. Com Commissioner Fish, and uh, my meeting got changed, so you've got me till 3.30 for okay. better or worse. So what I've tried to do is, in essence, show you, yes, there is a science, and okay. there is philosophical. Okay. We want to be contributors. We do pay that 65% off site Great. impacts. Thank you. And we pay for our area of land that does lie Thank you. on Thank you. I'll let you go a little bit longer, because you okay. were responding directly to the question I asked, yes, and, and you did an You wanted the job. numbers, right? Yeah, I okay. appreciated that. I will I, give you I the numbers. I don't need it right now. Oh, okay. Uh, so the economic up. impact you did ask about, and I, I feel bad that we weren't all prepared for that ahead of time, but for our mortgage alone, it's $15,000 a year. Okay. We are 52 homes. 15000 for 52 homes. That is correct. Okay, thank you. And Mayor, Mayor Fish, so yes. you're not leaving, is that right? Uh, not till 3.30. So, so I just want to just put a little plug in here. Yes, sir. So that was helpful. Thank you. You bet. Mm -hmm. I deeply appreciate, just as a member of this body, that we've now shifted to having a, a high-level conversation about the issue before us. Yes, sir. And very thoughtful people are now getting up and posing questions, philosophical, technical, scientific. Yes, sir. I want to assure you that our crack team is keeping a list of all those questions. Yes, sir. So you've just raised a question off of our um, stormwater uh, management plan, and you've, you've referenced some regulatory requirements. Yes, sir. What we will try to do to our best of our ability is capture the questions that were raised during this hearing and post the answers before we come back together okay. so that we give you the best, best opportunity to hear from the, from the Bureau what their response okay. is to the very thoughtful questions you're raising. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I really appreciate your testimony. Absolutely. Good afternoon, sir. All right. Uh, very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, members of the council. My name is Christopher Rich. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Perkins Coie. Appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Good regulation generally needs to come from sound policy, clear criteria, and consistent application. While we need to be respectful, I think we also need to be accurate today. This issue is not coming up because of something that is new. In 2015, the city abruptly changed course and started attempting to charge for overwater structures that for 40 years had been deemed off limits in terms of impervious surface. The city actually put this policy in writing and submitted that to Vigor Industrial in 2013, which is why when Vigor took this issue, my client, to the Administrative Review Committee, your committee unanimously held that the Bureau of Environmental Services had incorrectly overreached in its definition of impervious surface. They told them that it was contrary to the code and they directed them to refund two years of fees back to vigor. So the city has actually been instructed as to what the current code says and what the definition means. In fairness, this this ordinance is all about an attempt to undo the result of that hearing. Now, in terms of the actual ordinance itself, to Commissioner Fish's question, there are unfortunately defects, uh, policy criteria, and legal that I think this, board ne this, this, this body needs to understand because they must be addressed. Impervious surface serves as a proxy for stormwater that needs to be managed. This is how the entire stormwater code is written. This is how your manuals are written. What this does is that it basically takes 
an area over water structures that has never had any services that the city's provided and attempts to charge a stormwater management that's, fee. That's, that's the argument that she was making. The prior, well, yes, it, it's yes okay. but, it, but, it's, but it's embedded, it, more significantly, it's embedded in your code in terms of how the code, the administrative rules, and the rate studies, what's the policy behind it? The city has already made this determination. And the reason that the ARC ruled was that it was not just a definitional issue based on one term, it was inconsistent with the code. And that, need, that, that, is, that is going to be a problem if the council moves forward under the current can approach. You, can you Thank give you, sir. Carla your testimony? Yes. Can you give Carla your written testimony? Yes, be happy Thank to do Thank so. You, sir. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your testimony. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is C.W. Taylor. I'm president of West Hayden Island Orange and I respect your time, and I'm not gonna repeat what you guys have been listening to. Kath is one of our spokesperson from our mortgage, and we have one other one. So with that, I think you guys get the big picture. And I did not increase our dues and fees for this year because I feel that this is a no-brainer that you guys will understand, and we should win this case and do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, all three of you. Next three, please. Okay. Uh, was there David Beavers? Uh, the next three are John Johnson, Bob Turner, and Bob Hume. And they'll be followed by Jim Hiller, Hilland, I believe it is, George Donnerberg, and Sam Gal Galbraith. No. So please, Chief, I don't need That's a good question. We do have to change. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, would you like to start? Thank Certainly, you. Certainly, Mayor and Councillors. I'm John Johnson. I live at uh, McAdam Bay, which is across from Oaks Park, and I have a 984 square foot home, and I think it's going to cost me $300 a year to answer Commissioner Fish's question. Um, I know that the city has to, um, has reasonable reasons for this approach they're taking, but the, uh, I think the l language they're using in this ordinance is kind of a bridge too far and an awkward and doesn't make sense in the plain sense of the English language. Uh, redefining things such as impermeable. We know what permeable and impermeable are, but you can't just change the definition by defining it differently. You can't say this is a black wall just because I say it's a black wall. It's just not understood that way. Now for water-based activities such as marinas, moorage, there is no linkage whatsoever between either permeability or impermeability. We're the most permeable place in Portland. It goes straight in the river. And because there's no real, the city's really not involved, the bottom line, and therefore this user fee is irrational. It's not rationally linked to something that we're using. Uh, there being no linkage to a user fee, this is actually is a tax, and I'm sure there's a different way to get taxes passed. A completely separate point is that we have a 1,000 homes, I think, on appeal, the current uh, user fee structure. They want to get their money back. So you're talking about financial impact. We uh, encourage the uh, city to soberly look at what's happening here and refund the money to these people uh, when they reconsider this. Sir, can I ask you just one clarification? Yes, and I, um, <clears throat> I'm all for sober policy making. So I, I want to just ask you about so we're very clear about what we're, what we're, where there may be a disagreement. Do you challenge the notion of an off-site fee? No. So we're really we're just we're just talking about the on-site fee. That's me. Others may, and there may be some rationality to that, but I haven't. No, but I'm just at that asking issue. for you. I have not looked at that issue. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Bob Turner. I'm a retired university professor. I live at McAdam Bay Marina with my wife, who is a retired physician. Uh, I am going to curtail the remarks that I had to make because some of the previous remarks have made me question. Uh, I do believe that, uh, as you've heard before, uh, the, the runoff from our houses is not uh, going into any sort of stormwater pipes or uh, facilities that are supplied by the city. It seems to me that in the absence of the use of any city facilities by that stormwater, that this is not a fee. It is a tax, and it is a tax that is being directed at a particular group of individuals. And I would point out that 
The estimates that I've received so far indicate that this is about $28 per month per each of the 1,000 uh, floating homes in the Portland community, and that amounts to about $330,000 a year. I would submit that this is an issue that needs to be looked at much more carefully and that it is uh, not appropriate to be imposing this tax under the guise of a fee. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Afternoon. I'm Bob Hume, a long time, 50 years to be exact, resident at the Oregon Yacht Club Mortgage on the Willamette. Uh, as a floating homeowner, I'm going to appeal to a sense of fairness here. Uh, I urge the council to say no to the code change before you. Um, my argument would be that we, as a mortgage, already pay for the upland impervious uh, areas, uh, the fees that are involved there. We shouldn't pay for a service that we don't use by including the footprint of our roofs, the actual floating part of our mortgage. It has increased each homeowner um, a fee of 26 a month. Uh, it doesn't sound like a lot initially, but you add that up for a year and forever, and it, it, it makes a difference. Uh, our floating mortgage, I would argue, is not an impervious area. Very good. Thank you, all three of you. Next three, please. Our Jim Hill, sorry, Hillman, George Donnerberg, and Sam Galbraith. And they'll be followed by Ellen Wax, Susan, and Dan Carlson. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Hillman. I'm a resident of West Haven Island Moorage. <clears throat> and the um, important issue here, the authority to lever this, lever, levy this user charge is conveyed by the Portland City Code, which says, quote, ratepayers who receive a direct or indirect benefit from city stormwater management services are subject to the user charge, end quote. So fundamentally, if you receive a benefit, you pay the charge. That important concept is reinforced by another part of the code which says a user charge means a charge paid by a tax, a rate payer for the use of stormwater management services. So clearly the authority to levy a user charge is based solely on the concept that you pay for a service only if you are a beneficiary of that service. All right. Now here's the problem. The proposed language change in the ordinance eliminates all links between parties who pay for the service and the parties who receive the benefit from the service. It does this by removing the language tying the user charge to the user's proportionate share of stormwater management services. That goes away and instead it levies the charge on the amount of impervious surface on a taxpayer's property regardless of whether runoff from that surface is subject to the city's stormwater management service. The result of this change is that taxpayers who receive no benefit from the stormwater management services are still subject to the user charge. This is a violation of the statutory authority granted to BES and would be an obvious breach of BES's authority to levy a user charge. I've got three other arguments. I just am out of time. I'm going to be unable to make them, but... Uh, Could you give Carly your testimony? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll rewrite it and, and, and submit it for certain. We'll read it carefully, sir. Okay, very thank good. You. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, thank you for your time. I'm George Donnerberg. Uh, I developed um, and am a resident of McGuire Point Marina. It's the most easterly marina in the city of Portland. Uh, I'm here in that capacity. I also am a, a supervisor for the Multnomah County Drainage District. I'm not here in that capacity and not representing them. But I do understand the concept of citywide benefit. I also uh, applaud the work of BES for what they're doing. I'm here to discuss equity and the way that the, the uh, stormwater fee is being assessed. I think it's unfair to homeowners, floating homeowners. And as example, if I own a condominium uh, downtown on a 40,000 square foot block uh, and, and it had uh, 100 units on it, I'd be assessed based on 40,000 square foot divided by 100 units. Uh, in my situation, I live and developed a 41 unit floating home marina. We have roughly 41,000 square feet of impervious paved surface, which we pay a stormwater fee on. 
and now they're asking in addition to that fee, unlike the condominium, land-based condominium, which you could stack as many units as you want, because we went sideways out in the river, you're asking us to pay a fee on the impervious surface and also for our floating homes, which are out in the river, and I feel that that's basically unfair. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Sam Galbraith. I'm a resident of McAdam Bay. Um, I have been for 24 years. I'm the board. I'm the treasurer. Uh, I'm also uh, a member of the uh, River Community Advisory Committee of the Bureau of Development Services, and I'm on the uh, Waterfront Owners of Oregon Board. I just want to add a few more points. I hope it's not too redundant. Um, one is that we all have appeals. All of, all of the mortgages have appeals pending before the ARC. And those appeals are for, from relief for the off-site surcharge that started in August of 2015, based on, and, and they're based on Vigor's successful appeal, which you've heard about. If passed, this amendment places those appeals in question. We haven't had a clear answer from ARC or its staff as to whether our appeals are going to continue. We ask that the appeals be allowed to proceed on the interpretations applied to the Vigor case, and that whatever the resolution to the definition is not have any uh, cloud over possible retroactivity to our appeal. So that's a specific request that we allow those appeals to go ahead, get the same kind of relief that Vigor got. Second item, uh, until the summer of 2015, flowing structures were exempt, you've heard this, for the off-strike sewer stormwater charges for good reason. Rainwater uh, that falls on them never enters the city stormwater system. The, the uh, administrative changes without prior notification to, of affected parties was a means to increase fees while ignoring the quid pro quo requirement of the city code. We have always supported and shared support of the city's stormwater system through our offsite fees. It's the offsite fees that increase by this definition of, imper of, of impermeable unfairly to the, to the houses over the water. If clarification is to be made, it should include an exemption for floating homes and their odor over water infrastructure from storm water fees. Thank you. Thank you and perfect timing. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Next three, please. Are Ellen Wax, Susan Carlson, and Don Carlson. Would you like to go ahead and start, please? Good afternoon. Ellen Wax with the Working Waterfront Coalition. The coalition opposes this ordinance. Uh, the ordinance will codify a new category of structures subject to stormwater fees that target waterfront businesses in our working harbor. Many businesses already pay significant stormwater fees relative to their impact on the city's system since they occupy large tracts of improved property which is the basis of fee assessment. This ordinance expands the basis for assessing stormwater fees to a new class of structures that have been excluded since adoption of the code decades ago. The current definition of impervious area used for billing purposes demonstrates there is a distinction between overwater and land-based improvements for purposes of collecting stormwater fees. The recent ARC decision confirms this distinction. It's also important to note that many, if not all, harbor businesses with waterfront infrastructure are making significant investments in stormwater improvements to accomplish source control associated with harbor cleanup and address the industrial stormwater permit. The money spent on these site-specific improvements provides more benefits to stormwater quality than fees paid to BES. If the overall objective is to improve water quality from stormwater runoff, then it is counterproductive to assess more fees on these businesses rather than allow them to use the money to invest in facility-specific priorities. We urge the City Council to reject the ordinance. Thank Ellen, you. Can, I ask you, can I ask you a question? Because you and I usually meet pretty regularly, and we've never actually had it. We haven't in recent times met on this. What was the change in 2013 that you object to? What was the change? What, what did the council do in 2013 that triggered the vigor appeal that, that you feel was misguided? Um, 
Can I get back to you on that question? Well, let me ask you or, a follow-up question. Okay. What, what was the change in 2015 that you objected? Well, it's just, it's the adding, well, I guess more specifically, it's right now the adding of, of the overwater structure. So the, 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 the back to the definition of yeah, ground. Right. And did, was it your understanding that that change in how we measured the surface in 2015 had an impact on home on homeowners who happen to live in a floating home? Yes. And what's the basis of your belief on that? I understand that Vigor has hitched its wagon to this issue, but, but at some point we're going to have to separate fact from fiction in this hearing and get back to what we are proposing and what we're not. In, in what way do you understand that the change in how we measure the surface in 2015 impacted homeowners? Excuse me, houseboat owners. I don't think I, I, I can answer that question for you right now. Could you send me something in writing? Because yes. I, yeah. I, with all due respect, I think we're beginning to conflate and blur a number of issues. Vigor has a very specific issue. I'm not sure, with all due respect to my friends that are here from the home houseboat community, that you actually have the same set of concerns. And I want to make sure that we're separating that out and that we're not piggybacking off of one particular person's claims and that we're looking at them distinctly and separately because I think, that, I think the equities are different in both cases, in my own yes. view. But I want to make sure we're being clear about impact on homeowners, impact on industrial users. Okay. And you could help us with that okay. with just your follow-up written testimony. And thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Carlson. I'm a um, disabled veteran. I serve on the Waterfront Organization of Oregon's uh, board, and I'm a floating homeowner. Um, I think to answer Nick's question, with one, one thing is we had 40 years of not being included, and then in 15 they included us. Um, I think it was illegal, and I think it was against the law, and I think that will be proven in further um, litigation going forward. As a disabled veteran on a fixed income, another 25 bucks a month is a burden. And $300 a year or $6,000 for the next 10 years, you know, it gets to be, it's in perpetuity also. So it, it just gets to be a real unfair tax, if you will, on people that are not, reserving, are not receiving any benefit. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you for your Thank service. You. Next three, please. I show the last person signed up is Doug, and I believe the last name is, is Brown, maybe? On Bridgeton Road, I think it is. Doug? Did anybody else want to speak? Further questions, and then we'll have a Doug? Last call for anybody who would like to speak, please come on up. You're up. Yeah, is that okay with you? Yeah. Do a second, first reading. Do you have a time line in mind? Yeah. My name is Doug Brown. I'm a, no, a homeowner on um, a, a, uh, a floating home marina on Bridgeton Road. And this seems like a very simple issue to me. So the definition between impervious and pervious <coughs> surfaces uh, is what this comes down to. Um, like you've heard before, in, in 2015, all of a sudden, we started being charged for stormwater runoff treatment that we were not uh, a beneficiary of. The stormwater that runs off the roofs of our floating homes is not treated by your stormwater system. And it, it just seems to me so patently obvious that there is no reason to be taxed on something for a service that we're not receiving. So that's really what this comes down to. All right. That's Thank what you. I have. We appreciate it. Yep. Thanks for being here. So at this point, we'll call uh, staff back up. That's, that's the end of testimony, right? Great. Staff, come on up. So, Mayor, can I begin by setting a framework for further discussion and see what, if it's acceptable to my colleagues? Yes, sir. So. Um, first of all, uh, I thought this was a very productive hearing, and I thought that a number of people raised 
significant questions of law, of regulation, of definition, of common sense, of tax versus fee, and of fairness. So my suggestion is we do the following, as we often do on matters like this, which involve a complex regulatory system, where we want to bring the community along with us and make sure that people are clear about uh, our, trans our, our decision making. Number one, I propose that we continue this hearing, which would have the effect of having a second first reading on this matter, which means the next hearing would also be without a vote, but would be a chance to have feedback to the community from questions that are presented. So that's my first suggestion. My second suggestion is that we direct staff, and we have here staff from the Bureau and from the legal department, to do their best to compile a list of all the questions that were posed to council today and within a reasonable time to post the questions and preliminary answers to those questions. On the BES website, I think they should be posted um, on my website, any other commissioner that chooses to post them, and we would make it accessible to anyone here in the public or who is here who is at home watching on Channel 30 so that you could get the questions and answers. And we'll make sure that the website has all the companion documents cross-referenced so you don't have to spend a lot of time looking for things. Number three, um, I propose that we come back, Mayor, at a time certain, and, and I would urge you to consider while we have um, Carla here that we see if we can pick a time, for the purpose of having a second first reading in which we would have a staff presentation, further testimony on any of the issues that are still not resolved to the satisfaction of anyone who's raised them. And by the way, as Commissioner Fritz will often say at these hearings, and I'll say on her behalf, we really do read the emails and testimony we get. And if, if for some reason we don't have the time, we have smarter people on our staff read them and brief us. So if you've taken the time to put something in writing, please don't feel you have to go home and polish it. Just when in whatever form you're comfortable, send it, send it to the council. You can send it to the council clerk and she'll distribute it. You can send it to any member of council and they will distribute it. But we would like to have, to the extent possible, your written testimony and any follow-up testimony. Mayor, I think that it, it would be fair to have at least a two-week interval where people could put further testimony into the record and where staff could prepare a Q&A and update our FAQ. And I would suggest that, that we find a time three or four weeks out, if that's, if that's acceptable, I mean, if that's reasonable, Jonas, um, where we come back for a time certain. And the only other thing that is hanging that I think uh, because Mr. Galbraith raised it, I think we should, we should have a legal uh, opinion on this. Mr. Galbraith said there's other appeals pending and he doesn't want to see us do anything that has a retroactive effect. Um, Eric, my understanding is that we can only legislate prospectively and that whatever claims are in the pipeline, whatever issues have been raised, we can't retroactively impact those. Is that correct? That's correct. In any case, that's not the intent of this legislation. Right. It's only prospective. So, Mr. Right. Galbraith, I hope that answers your question, and we'd be happy to put that in writing, because it's not our intent to, yeah. to undercut any remedies people have under a prior interpretation of the code. It is our intent to have a robust discussion about whether the code should be updated to reflect um, the modern realities. So, colleagues, I, I would offer that as a proposed uh, road forward. So, let, let me put a few more, a uh, little more meat on those bones for discussion purposes. So, if we kept the record open, the written record open for two more weeks, that would be uh, until January 24th, Wednesday, end of the day, 5 p.m., January 24th. Um, if you wanted to come back the week after that, that would be Wednesday, the 31st of January. And I don't recall that we have 2035 on the agenda that day. I believe we have that on the 18th is my recollection. Correct. Uh, for the 31st time certain, are you thinking more than about how much time? I think we should, just to be safe, because there's a lot of people who have an interest, I think we should carve out an hour to be safe. Okay. And it would be 3 o'clock on the 31st. <laughs> that works for, I think that works for me and the Bureau Mayor. It depends on whether it works for my colleagues. Colleagues, I, I know I'm around. It's a Wednesday, correct? Yes. Commissioner Udaley? I'm checking my calendar. So just, just to be clear, Commissioner Fish, and it is your intent, uh, you will take 
written testimony up to the 24th. You will take additional questions from Council until the 24th. That gives the Bureau a week to compile responses for presentation on the 31st. Is it your intention that we also take testimony on the 31st? Yeah, I think we would treat it as a second first reading. So we would try to avoid, obviously, redundant testimony. But on the new matters that are raised, we'd want to have feedback from people. Uh, um, in particular, there's a number of lawyers following this, so we're likely to get written submissions. And then if the council at that point feels comfortable moving forward, or at least is comfortable moving to a vote, then we could, we could just put it over the next week in the ordinary course for a second reading. So I'm available until 445 on the 31st, and I also have a couple questions for staff. Mayor? That works for you, Commissioner. Right. Commissioner Daly. All right. It's, it seems to me that the argument that most of the people that came here to give testimony today are making is that changes in the last couple years and now these new changes in language in the code have, um, have compelled them to pay for services they're not receiving. So the first question is, if disconnecting from our storm, stormwater treatment system is an option for people who own houses that are on actual land, why can't homeowners who are on the water avail themselves of that same program? Okay, let me take a shot at that. Sure. And also uh, talk about the discount program. Um, Commissioner Udaly, again, I'm Caitlin Lovell with the Bureau for um, the Science Division, and I'll rely on Jonas to help me here a little bit. But all of the single family homes can qualify for what we call the Clean River Rewards Program, including the floating homes. Uh, so that is available to them, and I believe Jonas has some insight into the floating home communities in particular. Uh, yeah, so with relation to Clean River Rewards, which is a program available to all ratepayers uh, who qualify, uh, that refunds up to 100% of the on-site component, uh, which is 35% of that stormwater bill. My understanding is that of the uh, floating home communities, um, which are in our uh, ratepayer uh, record as multifamily residential, that of those multifamily residential rate accounts, uh, all but two of them are currently participating in the Clean River Rewards program. Uh, I believe the two that are not have not applied, and I don't know the detail behind that. We can get more information on that. So my understanding is that all uh, floating home multifamily residential ratepayers are currently receiving the Clean River Rewards discount for the on-site component. And, and how do people qualify for that program? Uh, there's a, a application uh, uh, program, a form online uh, that's filled out, and then we have staff who review. Uh, there's a variety of qualification uh, uh, requirements, uh, qualification options. Uh, for some, for example, it may be if you have an eco roof. That's not the situation here, but different types of uh, stormwater, uh, either on site management or characteristics uh, that uh, allow uh, eligibility for that program. And so we have staff who, uh, uh, ratepayer applies, we have staff who review that, and then the discount is uh, applied to the bill. Okay. And then my second question is about industrial versus residential properties. I certainly understand how. Um, silly it may seem to floating homeowners that they're being charged for rainwater that's simply running off their roof and not into our system. However, with industrial uh, customers who have structures over the water, that may not be the case because they're using those structures for activities that may create or add pollutants to the environment. So are we able to distinguish between residential and industrial? Um, if I understand the question correctly, you're, you're, talking, you're asking related to Clean River Rewards, I mean, as far as the on-site component that's generated. I, I mean, no, I'm talking in general in the code because it seems obvious to me that there is a difference in the environmental impact of water running off the roof of a home and water running off a dock or a pier that's being used for industrial purposes. Uh, I can probably help. I, I can answer some of that. Uh, the, 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 sorry, again, Eric Schaffner, City Attorney's Office. There is a difference in the, in, uh, uh, in the way that 
the uh, stormwater uh, contamination, if it's there, is viewed, and that's by using uh, permit requirements and benchmarks and those kinds of things. The type of contamination running off of a residential roof uh, generally doesn't rise anywhere near the kind of levels that we're talking about. So in, in general, uh, residential homeowners, including uh, uh, floating homeowners, including my house, uh, will not have to do anything special to treat the stormwater coming off the roof. They just have to keep it on the property or in the case of the houseboat owner, sending it into the river. Uh, in the case of an industrial discharger, uh, as has been discussed with the case of Vigor this morning or this afternoon, uh, if, if they're not meeting the state's benchmarks and the city's other permit requirements, they may not qualify for the discount even if they are managing all those stormwater on site. Okay, I mean, this is a relatively new issue for me, so I'm, you know, if I'm asking questions that don't make sense to you, I apologize, but it seems to me that the concern is with the change in our language that both residential and industrial users will be impacted when our real concern should be I think the industrial users, because there is a legitimate environmental impact. I th I, can I just say, colleague, that I thought they were fantastic questions. And one of the follow-ups I hope we do between now and the next hearing, since we have the benefit of the presidents of most of the floating home, if that's the proper term, associations, I would hope that you would get cards from the BES team here and make sure that to the extent there's a discount program, Clean River Rewards or anything else, which as um, you've heard, could, could offset 100% of the on-site cost of stormwater management. Let's make sure that you're aware of those programs and that if you haven't applied for them, that we help you apply for them so that you can fully mitigate the cost. So I'm just in that. So, I guess it's, I'm a little rusty on this stuff. It's been a while since I was the commissioner in charge of BES, but. Isn't the most uh, the single largest component of the on-site discount uh, disconnecting downspouts, if I recall? That's what I thought. I'm looking at. So how do you do that on a houseboat, what or what does that mean to um, disconnect your downspout on a houseboat? So, 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 so floating home. Sorry. Floating so I can I can tell you, Commissioner, that having gone it sinks. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you, Commissioner, having gone through myself the application the the. I live on dry land most of the time. The, the, the gutters of my house are connected to rain gardens. So there's no stormwater leaving from my roof area. Uh, in that respect, my house is no fun not functioning different at all from a houseboat owner. The stormwater uh, going down my driveway is captured by the city as I pay for that portion of it. Uh, so, I, uh, so if you're a floating home and you, you manage the runoff from your roof uh, through an on-site garden or something like a rain garden. Yep. Or, or as, and, and as, as I mentioned in uh, my definition of the two uh, uh, components of the charge, the main criterion is that the city is not receiving your stormwater from your property. So the on-site component has to be somehow dealt with on the property in a way that the city doesn't have to deal with it. And, and maybe if I can answer the question another way is there are multiple qualifications for the Clean River Pro uh, Mm -hmm. Clean River Reward Program, Downspout Disconnect is one of those components and probably one of the largest program-wide. There are other qualifying uh, uh, characteristics right. that also allow yeah. uh, so that. So oh, I yeah. mean, it sounds like every single floating home owner would qualify for this program. Uh, su subject to review of the circumstances, it's it, uh, under the current program, it uh, seems to be quite likely, yes. And in fact, to my knowledge, uh, any floating homeowner communities that have applied receive some level of that discount. Uh, Commissioner, th one of the reasons why you heard me earlier say I'm trying to separate out the industrial users from the residential users, because I think there has been a unfortunate blending and converging of the two interests. And the, the fact is, I think with the discount programs and other programs, we, we might be able to address many of the financial concerns. As you've pointed out, for the industrial user, there's different issues that, that we have to be concerned about in a heavily regulated river. So, colleagues, I, I'm going to jump to the front of the line for one moment because I'm going to have to leave and I'll turn the gavel over to Commissioner Fritz in a moment. Um, Two questions that, that I'd like to have answered. The, the, the question was raised about authority, fees versus taxation. I'd like to have more in-depth information on that. Uh, somebody raised the question of can you legally change the definition of impermeable? I found that to be an interesting uh, question. Um, 
I don't have a particular uh, sense one way or the other on that, but I thought it was a valid question, and I'd, I'd be curious to know what the answer uh, is with regard to that. And th those are my two most pressing, and I'll get you uh, more detailed follow-ups after that. I'm sorry, colleagues, that I have to, to run, but I have uh, an engagement. I'll pass this over to Commissioner Fritz. Commissioner Fritz. We're just doing it this way for today. Oh, okay. The sponsor, so she's going to... I'll, oh, I'll, give, okay. I'll give you a turn. Yeah, it was pre-arranged. Uh, the, the question, ordinarily it would pass to the council president, who's Commissioner Fish, but we made an arrangement since Commissioner Fish is sponsoring this, and there were lots of disparate views, that we'd pass it over to Commissioner Fritz, so there would be... Um, uh, so you can all be mad at me when I gavel it out. Exactly. That's Thank the main you thing. for saying it better. Thank <laughs> you. Commissioner Salzman, did you have a question can, or comment? Well, I, um, the Administrative Review Committee decision that was rendered in November, that applied only to Vigor? That's correct. So the floating home associations were not part of that? They, they were not in that appeal. Okay. So I guess, you know, I guess, uh, you know, the mayor mentioned a few minutes ago that sort of some philosophical concerns, and I guess, I guess one of the overriding philosophical concerns that I see is that you have a party that prevailed two months ago in a decision that's been challenged since its inception, and it seems, you know, it, it kind of gives resonance to all those resonance to all those issues about, well, you can never beat government because government will just simply change the law, change the rules to ultimately prevail. And, and I can't help but feeling that's a little bit what's going on here. And I think that was maybe some of Mr. Sprott's frustration, obviously, as he expressed it. Um, so I guess that's my philosophical concern that I'm entering this uh, next round of decision making on is, you know, at what point, if you win, you win. <coughs> so. You know, Commissioner Salzman, I just note that, that the city frequently appeals decisions that we disagree with, and you've cast probably hundreds of votes appealing decisions of the courts and administrative agencies we disagree with. I'm less concerned about what an advisory body, the ARC, uh, renders as a decision what, what my, my philosophical approach to this is, what's the right outcome? We have, we have a code, we have administrative rules, we have regulatory requirements in the river. My interest is, what's the right outcome? And I think people have raised a lot of questions today, which, which we, should, we should ponder very carefully in striking the balance. But the city routinely updates its code when it turns out the code is no longer tailored to the, to the, to the current circumstances. And I think that's actually something we do regularly and without controversy. So, again, my touchstone is going to be what's the right outcome? Commissioner Fritz. Are you done with your questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just have a few uh, questions and comments. Um, first of all, the title of this item is Clarify Stormwater Billing Methodology. <clears throat> which I would have to say for the general public would have to not think I'm going to rush down to City Hall and testify on that. That sounds fascinating. Um, so thank you for digging into it, everybody who has, and recognising that this is a significant issue. Secondly, for my parents in North Cherrywood Village and others who may be watching at home, they then would have realised that it is an issue about... Um, floating homes and riverside um, businesses. And so they may have been thinking, well, this doesn't affect me if I live in East Portland or Southwest or somewhere that's not connected um, to a houseboat. <clears throat> I think it would be very helpful at the next hearing if we had a presentation on the Clean River Rewards, because it, uh, you have to apply to get this discount on your stormwater fee. I don't think everybody knows about it. It's um, helpful to revise it every, and, and also for, us, for all of us to understand what goes into getting those discounts. I know I live in, in Deep Southwest where part of my discount is because I've got a lot of trees on my property. So not only does the rainwater not, leave the, um, not get into the river, it stays on the property and goes back up into the atmosphere. So that's a different kind of... Um, water dynamic than what we're talking about here for the river, uh, river boats, the houseboats. So that I think would be very helpful so that we can make sure that everybody understands. Um, it sounds like all of the houseboat communities are eligible for this 100% discount um, subject to certain conditions. And if that's the case, perhaps we have less of a disagreement than might have appeared. Um, I heard a couple of people say that 
the 65% off-site fee that goes into the stormwater was something that should not be um, assigned to ratepayers. Um, so I think it would be helpful also to have a little um, tutorial on how that is set and why it is set on rates rather than general fund. And um, secondly, the uh, status of the mighty rivers, the Columbia and the Willamette, in terms of um, stormwater conveyance, how do they fit into our system? Do they get, <coughs> excuse me, again, in Southwest, lots of the stormwater doesn't go into sewers, it goes into creeks. And part of the reason that we pay stormwater fees is to make sure that we manage erosion in those creeks, do some habitat repair, those kinds of things. What's the status of the Willamette, the Willamette and the Columbia when we're talking about the citywide stormwater system? Um, and I forgot what my third point is, which is really unfortunate. I thought it was a really good point. Um, First two were pretty good. I, w I, was, I, was, I was really motoring there, wasn't I? Um, I'm sure it'll come back and I will uh, ask it in, in the future. But I think those were the, were the two main things. That I, oh, I know. I've actually written it down and, and circled it. So that's always handy. Um, <laughs> the definition, it was claimed that there's no definition of impervious surface in the stormwater manual. Um, I find that hard to believe. Um, and if not, why not? Commissioner, I can address that quickly. Uh, and I very much appreciate Mr. Sprott's bringing that up because we did overlook the fact that the, uh, the definition in the manual is actually impervious surface, not impervious area. So we will modify the code to make sure that uh, that word changes is, is taken account of. Well, I would have to say when I ran for council in 2005 that my oldest son, who was a teenager at the time, said, Mum, don't talk about stormwater management or impervious surface. Nobody cares. <laughs> so I think we've come a long way um, in the last 12 years that lots of people care, as, as we should. So those, uh, uh, we'll have another discussion um, on the 31st at 3 o'clock. Please get your questions, concerns, comments in. I hope this has clarified a little bit what we're doing. Mr. Wagner, I can see you have a question, but I'll ask you afterwards, OK? Because we're done with the uh, current testimony. Um, anything else, Commissioner Fisher, the sponsor? No, only that I appreciate all that uh, the people took the time to come out and testify. I was a little chagrined when I saw some stuff on social media that, that sort of impugned the process. And I've been doing this for nine years. Um, we don't always get it right. Um, we're not perfect. No one up here claims any special insight. But what I have learned on this council is that when we put an item on the agenda and we say we're going to honestly engage it, listen to the public, and try to get to the right outcome, more often than not, that's what my colleagues do. And, and I hope that you who are here today are reassured that we're working together to try to get this right. So I appreciate the testimony and the tenor of the testimony. And, um, as the commissioner in charge of the bureau that brought this proposal forward, uh, we'll make sure that we follow through on all the commitments that have been memorialized mm -hmm. by the acting president and the, uh, and the mayor. Thank, Thank you, you. everybody, for coming. Oh, I just wanted to say if we could clarify for the record that this is a continuation of the hearing. Continuation of the hearing. Rather for than a second first reading, just, just, just right. so it's right. Continuation of the hearing for, uh, technicality for the 31st at 3 p.m. For those of you who found this interesting, tomorrow at 2 o'clock we have a five-year update on the Neighborhood Prosperity Network. So tune in again. Come on down. It's more good news. You can reserve your existing seats for a small <laughs> fee. <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all.